Hello, everyone. Welcome to WizConnect, connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. My name is Sagar Kapoor. I'm part of customer success team at Tableau. First of all, happy new year to the entire data fam. I hope this year brings prosperity and success to everyone. And also, we are starting a season four for WizConnect. So thank you for giving all the support for WizConnect. I think it has been a great journey. And without your help and support, it would have not been possible. So all the sessions which are presented in WizConnect are posted to our YouTube channel. Go ahead, subscribe to it. Some great content waiting for you. We have our LinkedIn group. Go ahead, connect with each other and learn from each other and stay updated with all respect to WizConnect over there. And with that, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Uh, her name is Lisa Trescott. She is a research analyst at Miracosta College, where she supports the efforts of student equity and achievement programs. She uses Tableau on a daily basis to examine student outcomes and assess the college with strategic planning. Lisa has been using Tableau for the last 4.5 years, but just started becoming active in Tableau community earlier in 2021. She was one of the three finalists in IronWiz Global 2021 competition and won the competition with a visualization on breakthrough artists. Outside of Tableau, Lisa loves board games, crafts, hiking, and playing with her two cats. Today, she will go ahead and give a deep dive into the Iron Wiz 2021 Wiz, which she built. So without further ado, Lisa, over to you. Thanks, Agar. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. And perfect, Lisa. Your screen is visible. Perfect. All yours. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me today, Sagar. And like he said, Happy New Year to everybody. I'm excited to be here kicking off uh, season four of Viz Connect with you all. Uh, as Sagar mentioned, I'm going to be going through my Iron Viz build with you all today. I'm going to slow it down for you. And so you can actually see what I was doing. And I'll give you some tips and tricks kind of along the way. Um, if you're unfamiliar with IronViz, it's a competition in which three finalists get the same data set and we have a set amount of time to uh, analyze the data and come up with a visualization. So in this case, we have two and a half weeks where we could practice it and start building it. In, in, and then come competition day, we have to rebuild that visualization in 20 minutes. So it's super fast uh, and then give a presentation on it. And so I ended up winning IronViz this year with this visualization on breakthrough artists. And so what you can see is there's some animation here. We've got, um, oh, it's not running, okay. Uh, so there's some animation at the top, there we go, with the maps uh, showing artists when they hit on Shazam uh, city charts. And we've got a progress bar that kind of moves behind here as well. There's some um, interactivity at the bottom where you can click on the data points and you can play the song uh, through a Spotify playback button. So I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to show you how I built all this and accomplished this in 20 minutes. So let's go ahead and start. So the very first thing I did is I wanted to bring in a custom color palette in Tableau. So you can see I've got this blue, yellow, and pink color palette here. So the way to do that is in your Tableau repository, which is just in your documents, you go down to your preferences folder or file and right click on it. We're going to open it with a notepad or any kind of text editor that you have. And I've cleared it out. So this is what a blank preferences file looks like. And all you have to do to add a color palette is copy some code and paste it here between these two workbook flags. And essentially you just have this preferences tag and another preferences flag. And then you uh, add this color palette code right here in the middle. So you just name it, you add your hex codes in, save it, and you're good to go. And you have to do this before you open Tableau. If you have Tableau open and then try to add a custom color palette, it's not gonna be accessible to you in Tableau. So make sure you do this before you open Tableau. And then I also added some custom shapes here too. So you can add custom shapes to your repository here. And I have two shapes that I'm gonna use uh, during the build today. So I threw those in there as well. So when we open Tableau, <laughs> we're gonna connect to our data sources. So all three finalists had access to Tableau prep, which was Awesome because I prepped the heck out of this data using prep. Uh, pretty much everything that I possibly could, I put into prep because everything you have to do extra during the build is going to take up time. And so 
every single calculation, every single data restructuring, everything was done in prep to the point where I only had two calculated fields in my entire workbook. Uh, so yeah, so put everything in prep if you can, uh, uh, if you're gonna be speed busy. So to connect to a Tableau prep flow, we go here to more, and I'm gonna, I have four data sets that I have to bring. So I'll bring in the first one, and then a great little hotkey that I picked up by doing our invis was control D. That's just gonna pop up your new data source window. And then again, you can hit more. We'll bring in the YouTube data. I'm gonna control D again, bring in the first Shazam, and then control D one more time and bring in our global Shazam data. And now I've got all four of my data sets in here, up here at the top, you can see. And my Sue visitor had a fantastic suggestion. She said, why don't you name the data sets in the order that you're going to use them? So uh, when you're doing our invis, there's tons of stuff going on in your brain. You're trying to hold a ton of information. So anywhere you can cut out basically any extra thought process, any mental gymnastics that you don't have to do during the build is gonna be a bonus. So this was a great suggestion. Uh, and it was really helpful going through uh, the bids. I'm gonna try to move this thing over here. Okay, so I'm also gonna set up some default formatting so that my workbook is ready to go. So just format your workbook. And then I changed my font to Tahoma. There's only about eight or so fonts that are Tableau Public safe, so they'll render properly on Tableau Public and Tahoma is one of them. So I went ahead and chose that. Uh, during the build, I made my font seven point, uh, which I know one of the judges was unhappy with because it was pretty small. I'm going to make it a little bit larger for you so you can actually see the font uh, as I go through it. And then I'm going to change it to this little off white color. I'm also not a big fan of grid lines, so I'm going to turn those off. And I turned off my zero lines and I changed my axis rulers to be that that white color. And then there's no way to uh, there's no option to turn off axis ticks. Uh, so I just turned the opacity all the way down to zero. It basically will have the exact same effect as turning off those lines. And then I'm gonna format my sheet. So I'm gonna right click on the sheet and format. And during the build, I made all of my sheets transparent. That's because at the end, uh, when I started building everything out, about half of my charts needed a transparent background to look correct on the final viz, and about half didn't. And I knew that if I could just do them all in transparent, I wouldn't have to spend time at the very end going back and reformatting. Because again, any time, any extra clicks you can save uh, during our invis is gonna help you with your speed. So I made everything on transparent backgrounds, which made it a little bit hard to see. Um, so I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna go ahead and make it uh, this dark blue color, which is the end color of my viz, so that you can actually see what I'm doing today. I also went ahead and turned off my row and column dividers. And this is how I wanted all of my sheets formatted. So at this point, I ended up just duplicating this a whole bunch of times so that I had sheets that were already formatted and ready to go when I got to them. Uh, so I really like doing it this way because then it was just, I had my canvas all set. Uh, if I were visiting in real life, not under a time constraint, what I would typically do is I'd probably build out my viz and then I would right click on the sheet, I'd copy formatting, and then I would go back to the new sheet and I'd right click and paste. It has the exact same effect, but it has, as you can see, that's a lot more clicking. And again, we're trying to reduce our clicks. So, okay, after all of that formatting, we're gonna go ahead and build out our first visual, which is gonna be this chart over here on the left. This is the uh, chart metrics CPP rank, which is their cross platform performance rank. It's just their way of ranking artists over time so that we can have, uh, we can see kind of who's at the top of the industry and who is not. And so what I wanted to show was where did all of our artists start? And then how high did they go in this ranking system? And then where did they end up at the end? So we've got three different types of rank. So I'm gonna bring that onto columns and I'm gonna make this a little bit wider. I'm just hitting control and my right arrow key to kind of widen this out a little bit for you. And you can see Tableau defaults and sorts these in alphabetical order. So I'm just gonna click on best rank and drag it to the middle because that's what I want in the middle, right? So we've got the start, best, and then the final ranking at the end. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring on this measure here. I called it all artist rank. This is the rank for all artists who are not the three focal artists in the biz. And then I'm gonna bring on my three artists, which are the, which is the three focal artists that I chose. 
and I'm going to dual axis it. So I'll right click and dual axis and you can see it defaults to making this a circle chart. I'm going to change it to a line. And then I'm going to bring CM ID that's chart metrics ID. It's basically their unique identifier for all of the artists. I'm going to bring that onto detail. So we have a line for every artist. And I just broke the cardinal rule. I didn't <laughs> synchronize my axes. So I forgot when I made this a dual axis. I want to make sure we synchronize this and then hide the header so that all of our, our um, measures are on the same axis. And I'm going to go ahead and take measure names off of color too. So, because we're dealing with rank data, lower ranks are better, right? A rank of one is the best. And so, uh, Tableau, we just need to uh, reverse the axis here. So, I'm just going to double click and reverse it. And what you can see is things are super dense at the top of this chart. It's basically impossible to tell or distinguish any artist from another because they're just all kind of bunched up there at the top. So, in order to fix that and kind of disperse the data a little better, I also click this logarithmic button. So that makes the scale logarithmic, meaning that instead of uh, each tick on the axis being a base of one, it changes to a base 10. So it helps kind of just distribute your data a little bit. And I'm also going to change the tick marks to be fixed at every 100 because we don't that's too many. We don't need all of those uh, tick marks. Okay, so for the uh, for all the artists who are not our three focal artists, I kind of just wanted them to be really kind of like a light wispy line, just there for context so that you could see the three artists uh, how they stood out from the rest. So I wanted to make them really faint color, so I'm going to make them that kind of light white color again, and I'm going to change the opacity and then bring it down to thirty, and I'm going to bring the size down as small as it'll go. And you can see I'm starting to get that kind of spider webby line effect that I wanted. For our three artists, I'm going to add my color field onto color. And then we'll go ahead and use that custom color palette that we brought in. You can see it's down here at the bottom of the list. Uh, and so it's there ready for us to use. And I'll go ahead and assign those three colors to our artists. And click OK. And I'm going to bring the size up a little bit as well. I'm also going to hide this indicator. This is just saying, hey, you've got a whole bunch of null artists for that free artist rank because I only brought in the three for this one. So we've got some null people we need to hide. And then uh, this looks fine on this sheet, but when I put it on the final viz, this uh, block here in the middle looked super dense. It ended up looking just like an opaque white block, which I did not like. And so I ended up filtering this data to only show artists from Australia and the US, which are the two countries that our three focal artists are from. So if I click on Australia and I hold control, and click on the US, I've got both of these two highlighted. If you press your space bar, it will automatically check both of those countries. So uh, that's a really quick way to just select uh, select things in your filter by that space bar. And now you can see we've got a way less lines and it's easier to interpret. And I'll hide this rank type. And it also looks like we don't have an axis on this chart. So let's get rid of that as well. Okay, so that's that's the CPP rank chart. Because CPP rank is not a metric people are familiar with, it's not like YouTube and Shazam, uh, I wanted to add a little info icon so that people, if they didn't know what CPP rank was, they would be able to just hover and get a little bit more information about it. So in order to do that, if I double click on columns and I just type in two open quotation marks, I essentially get a placeholder mark on my, on my visual here. And I'm going to go ahead and change this to a shape and let's make this a little bigger so you can see. So Tableau is just going to put their default shape here. And this is where 1 of those custom shapes comes into play. Go here and you can see, I've got my iron iron viz shapes here. And it looks like there's only 1 shape, but there's actually 2, because this is just a white info icon. So you can't see the white on white. So we'll click that and click. Okay. And now we've got a little info icon that we can edit the tool tip of, and that's really all I wanted to do. Uh, it's just add some informational text here into the tooltip. So now when somebody hovers on the dashboard, they'll be able to get a little bit more information about CPP. Okay. I should also mention, I'm, this is the only tooltip I'm going to format for you because it's really just me copy pasting text and I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time uh, doing that. So uh, no tooltips in this, in this bit, in this build. 
So next we're going to go to our YouTube uh, data, which is just showing. It's just this line chart right here, which is showing uh, YouTube channel hits over time. I was super self conscious about this visualization in particular, because it is so simple. You know, it's, it's nothing more than just a basic line chart. Um, but every time I tried to kind of jazz it up or give it some extra flair, it just kind of seemed like a distraction from kind of the, the show in the middle of the viz. So I stopped overthinking it and I said, just leave it as a basic line chart. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to bring my month field out. I'm going to right click and drag it up onto columns. By right clicking and dragging, you get this automatic pop up that asks you how you want your date formatted. And so uh, that's a good way to save time as well, because if I had just clicked and dragged like normal, then I would have to go through a bunch of menu options in order to get the date the way I wanted it. So this is just that automatic pop up. So I'm gonna click OK. And then I'm gonna bring views, add onto rows, artist name onto color. And because we're in a new data set, we have to assign our palette again. And something I wasn't able to do on that CPP rank chart that I'll do here is use this assign palette button down here at the bottom. I couldn't do it before because we had all those null artists in it. But if you just click this button, it's gonna assign your colors in the same order that, uh, that they're listed here. So I strategically put those hex codes in that custom color palette in the order that I knew the artists were gonna show up here. So you can just use that assign palette button. And we'll bring the size up just a little bit. And then I'm gonna format this axis. So I wanted this to just be a uh, abbreviated month and a two digit year on the axis. So I'm gonna right click and format this. And if you go over here to dates, you're gonna see that formatting is not an option here. So we have to go ahead and use a custom date format. And this is super easy. All you have to type in is MMM, right? And then you get your three character abbreviated month. I'm gonna do space YY. And then we get the abbreviated month and the two digit year just right there except for us to go. I'm also going to delete this header because I think it's pretty obvious that this is a month. Okay, so that is our basic YouTube line chart. And now we're going to get into kind of some of the more fun stuff. We're going to get into the Shazam data that's in the middle. And I'm going to build out these three maps that are across the top showing when the artists are hitting on Shazam uh, country lists, or excuse me, city lists. So the easiest way to create a map in Tableau is to just double click on your geographic point. So I'm gonna just double click on city and you're gonna see that it's automatically gonna generate a map for me with all of the cities uh, in my data. So we actually had a lot of ambiguous cities in this data set. So that meant that there were cities that were not attributed to a region or a state, so they couldn't be mapped. And that's why I've got this indicator down here telling me I've got all these unknowns. So I'm just gonna right click and hide that. Now, when it comes to formatting maps, Tableau has some default format options, right? If you go up here to map and background maps, you can change it to dark, you could change it to any normal. But what I really wanted was to get the watercolor to match seamlessly with this kind of gray blue color that I used in the final visualization. In order to get something custom like that, you need to use Mapbox which I had never used before, uh, but I was pleasantly surprised with how easy it was. So if you go to Mapbox website, they have some templates that you can use. And I just took their basic template. I modified the watercolor, I modified the land color, and I just turned off a bunch of the, um, the labels. And then they have an option on there to use the map in a third party application, which would be Tableau, and they generate a code for you. And so if you go back up to map and background maps, there's this option to add a map box map. So if I click that, I'm just gonna name it. And this is the code that Mapbox just generates for you. I'm gonna copy paste it there. You can see now I've got watercolor that matches this kind of gray blue background and I've got my black land color and I'm all set. And so it was super easy to use Mapbox to integrate it with Tableau. I also used a custom shape on this. so. Again, I'm gonna go back to my shapes and we're gonna use one of the custom shapes that I brought in. It's this kind of glowy point here. So this was created by Sarah Battersby. She is, you can find her on Twitter as the maps overlord and that she is, she is a fantastic person with maps. Uh, and she's the creator of this shape. And I liked the way it kind of just gave it this kind of glowing effect, right? So when, when artists were popping up on the charts, it just kind of looked like a little uh, like, 
flow pop up, which I really liked. And I liked that it made it kind of look like a density map too. So that's the shape I use. I'm gonna bring the size up just a little bit. And then I'm also gonna bring artist name onto color. So again, we've got a new data set. So we have to assign our color palette again. And this is the main reason I put that color palette in beforehand because I had to assign it four times. And so the easiest way and fastest way to do that was just by creating that custom color palette. Okay, so now we're ready to add in that animated piece. <clears throat> so the way you can animate your data in Tableau is with the pages shelf, which is up here in the top left corner. I'm gonna right click and drag week of up onto pages. And again, because I right clicked, I got the automatic pop-up and I'm gonna click discrete week. And when you do that, you automatically get this control panel over here for the pages shelf. So you can see as I click through it, the data is changing uh, based on where we are in the time series. And so that's, it's super easy to get that animated effect. I had never used pages before. I just never felt like I had a great use case for it. Um, and so this was exciting that I got to finally put this into a visualization. So one other thing we're gonna do on this map is I'm gonna add a label to it. So if you'll notice, Olivia Rodrigo has this label over here just telling the user what week we're in uh, of the time series. So I'm gonna add that to her map. And I've already built this uh, calculation out in Tableau Prep, uh, but I'm gonna build it for you from scratch so you can actually see what I'm doing. My absolute favorite Tableau hotkey that I learned while I was doing Arnviz was Alt-A-C. It just automatically brings up that calculated field window for you. Uh, and so I use this Literally every time I build a calculated field now, uh, it's, it's a huge time saver. So what I need is basically a uh, kind of like what I did with the info icon. I needed a placeholder mark on this map. So in order to do that, I'm using Tableau's make point function. So what this is, is you're literally just making a point out of latitude and longitude coordinates. So I'm going to type in zero, zero so that you can see what this is doing and we'll just give this a name. And we'll click apply. So if you click apply, it'll automatically add that calculated field for you. And then I'm going to drag it out and put it on my map layers just so you can see what's going on. And it's going to pop up really small here in the middle. So let's make it a little bit larger so you can see what's actually happening. So that zero, zero point, this is at zero latitude and zero longitude. If you start playing around with your latitude and longitude coordinates, you'll see what happens when you put in a value of 50, it's gonna jump up on the map. And if you put in a value of you know, negative 50, it's gonna go to the left. So we're gonna get a point over here. I wanted my point to be down here in this bottom right-hand corner. So the magic number for that was negative 55 and 80. And that's going to put the point exactly where I want it down here. And now I have a field that I can edit and just add some text to. So let's change it back to a text mark. Size down if we want it to be that giant. And I'm going to hold control and drag my week of from my pages shelf onto my text field. That's just going to create a copy of it. And it's going to be formatted the same way as it is in the pages shelf. And you can see now I've got my, my week of here. And I'm just going to type out week of in front of it. And I'll make it bold. <laughs> and you can you can kind of see we're getting kind of this weird black halo effect on here. Um, the way you get rid of that is by changing the opacity. I don't know why, but the magic number to get rid of it in general is just 89. So if I click 89, you're going to see it goes away. If I change it back to 90, it comes back. Uh, so 89 is the magic opacity number to get rid of that. I'm actually going to bring it all the way down to 50. So we don't get that little halo anymore. And now at this point, I did something kind of out of order. So I went ahead and started building out my viz at this point. That was because I wanted all three of my maps to be pinned in the exact same location. And if at this point I had duplicated all three maps and then brought them onto the visualization at the very end, I would have had to pin each one individually and kind of hope that I got them in the right position. So. In order to avoid that, I went ahead and started building out my final viz. 
which I floated and immediately turned off the phone layout for. So I went to the phone layout and deleted it because in 20 minutes, I don't know if it would be possible to create uh, both a desktop and a phone layout. And so the, the size of my, uh, my desk, my viz is going to be 1700 by 10 to 50. And then I can go ahead and bring out my background image. So I used a background image primarily for time. Uh, because when I did this, I had all of my text formatted. I had all of my background colors formatted. Everything was already kind of in place. And so to format all of those text boxes would have taken a really long time if I hadn't used that background image. So a fun little trick I picked up from a Flare Lodge Twins blog post. It was one of their you know, top Tableau tips is if you're on your dashboard pane here and you want to switch to your layout, if you just hit T on your keyboard, it toggles for you. So you can toggle back and forth just by hitting T. And that was also something that I used to save time so that I didn't have to nag. It seems silly, you just navigate over and click, but just hitting the T was a little bit faster. So I'm gonna bring this image up to zero, zero. So it's gonna bring it up to the top left corner up here. And I'm gonna size it the same size as my dashboard. Now you can see I have the background image fitting the whole size of the image. And I created this using Photoshop which I had just learned Photoshop over the summer, so it was really good timing. Uh, and prior to that, I had only really used PowerPoint to create images, to create icons and stuff for my visuals. The issue with PowerPoint is that it's much harder to dial in the pixels. So in Photoshop or Illustrator, you have the option to create an image that is exactly you know, 1700 by 1050. So you can get that really pixel perfect layout and it just helps to keep your text super crisp, because that was something that I noticed with PowerPoint is a lot of times I would create something in there and I would bring it into Tableau and my text would get kind of fuzzy a little bit or a little grainy. And that's just because you can't dial in the pixels as well. So <clears throat> Photoshop and Illustrator are great for that. A free option is Figma. So that's a design tool that you can use. It's web-based. And uh, Lindsay Betzendahl has tons of awesome tutorials on how to get started with Figma if you need a free option for a design tool and you want to get that kind of pixel perfect layout. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring that map on. So we're gonna drag out Olivia's map and we're gonna go ahead and turn off the title. I didn't actually know that this radio button was here for a show title. Uh, my sous visitor Esther is the one who told me that was there. So it's just a nice one click option to turn the title off. And then we're gonna go ahead and put her in the exact right coordinates. And so what I meant before by pinning it, as you can see, I've got a lot of Antarctica. It's kind of just not in the exact right position that I want it. And so I'm just going to kind of move this around, get rid of all those Antarctica land because I don't have any data in Antarctica. And I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my map options so that no one can come in here and scroll on it or zoom on it. And now it's just fixed. You know, you can't do anything on there. We also got this pages shelf automatically added. So this is, again, what kind of allows for that time series animation effect uh, that we're going to have at the very end. Okay, so let's go back to our map. And I'm going to duplicate. So now you can see it's kind of pinned in a different spot than it was. And so at this point is when I'm going to duplicate it. So I'll duplicate it once. And this is going to be either Giveon's or the Kid Leroy's map. And so neither of their maps have this label on it. So I'm just going to click this little eyeball here on my mark, on my uh, marks over here to turn it off. If I were building this out, again, not in a time crunch, I would actually remove the, the layer completely, but if this is two clicks versus one click. And so I just chose to do the one click and I'm going to duplicate it one more time. And then I'm going to filter these to keep one artist per map. So super fast way to do that is if you uh, go over here to your color palette, if you right click here on Giveon and go down to keep only, you're going to see now I've got a filter automatically applied that just keeps Gibby on. Same thing over here, I'll do this with Kid Leroy. And I'm gonna get a filter for him. And one last time for Olivia Rodrigo. And that's just much faster than, you know, dragging out your filter, selecting the artist you want and hitting okay. It's just that, you know, again, that, that click reduction that is so uh, imperative for Iron Biz. All right, so next we're gonna add, we're gonna build out these country, I've been calling them the country dot charts. So this is gonna show when artists are hitting 
on a country level Shazam chart. And the first thing I wanna do is add my city filter. So this data has both city and country level information in it. I don't want that because I don't wanna show all of the cities again. So I'm gonna just filter to whole country. If I click in here and do control A, it's gonna select everything. And then again, I can use that trick of the space bar and just unclick everything and then select my cool country level data. Okay. So I'm gonna bring country uh, artist name onto detail and country onto detail. And then I'm gonna right click and drag week of out here onto columns. I'm gonna make this continuous because I'm gonna need to edit the axis. I'm gonna need to fix it at a uh, start and end point. So I'm gonna hit okay there. And then I'm gonna again, right click and drag rank. So I get this automatic pop-up asking me how I want it, and I want it to be an average rank. Then I'm gonna hit OK. And now we're getting all these crazy fun lines. I'm gonna add artist name to color, and I'm gonna change this to a circle, because I don't want these to be this crazy scribble. I just want it to be circles. And I'm gonna bring the size down a little bit, and I bring the opacity down, because we've got some overlapping marks, and so I want there to be a little bit of opacity so you can kind of Again, we're using rank data, so we have to reverse the axis. So I'll just reverse it. I don't need to do the logarithmic trick here. And then, like I said before, I need to modify this axis so that I can fix the start and end points. The reason I need to do that is because Giveon doesn't have any data prior to May, right? So if I were to filter and just keep Giveon, I'll show you, my axis changes and it doesn't sync up with the other, uh, with the same time frame as the other. So I need to be able to fix this. So I'm just gonna double click and I fixed it to be slightly before the start of this data and slightly after the end of it. And I changed my tick marks to be fixed every eight weeks. This was kind of a trial and error process of just dialing it in to make sure that I got January on the beginning of the axis and July at the end. And then I'm gonna reformat this similar to how I did before. I'm gonna use that custom date format and then then y y to get that same uh, abbreviated month and two digit year and i forgot i'm going to turn off this week of title because we don't need that okay so i'm going to go ahead and duplicate this two more times so that i have a good chart for all three of my artists and then i'm going to do that same trick again where i keep only using the color palette up here and i'll do that again and then I'm gonna duplicate this one more time. So duplication is key in our invis. Anytime you can duplicate a chart and modify it, you're gonna save yourself some time. And so I'm gonna take everything off except for my week of here at the top because I want that to stay. So at this point, I want to build out these moving progress bars. So I didn't wanna animate the marks on the country level charts because if I did, and I'll show you what would happen. If I had added week of to the pages shelf here, I would have had a big giant blank void on the final viz before we started animating. And I didn't want that. I didn't want there to just be this big gap in the middle of the, of the viz. So to get around that is how it, is why I made those progress bars that move kind of behind the data. So to build that out, I'm gonna just double click here onto rows and type min of one. This is gonna add a point at one for every single week in my data set. And so if I change this to a bar and I'll change the color to this like white color and I'll bring the opacity down. Now I have a bar at every single week and we'll reformat the axis. We'll fix it at from zero to one because I want the bar to take up the whole, the whole uh, viz here. And now if we add week of to pages here and animate just this, now we have a moving progress bar because it's just gonna pop up every week in sync with the with the maps. So that's what I wanted. And then I didn't need all of these headers. So I'm gonna remove all of those. And I'm going to take off axis rulers. And now we just have that progress bar. And so I actually named this uh, this sheet. Unlike or you can see I haven't named anything up until here, but these I needed to be able to find because they were it was imperative that I layered them properly when I put them on the viz. So I actually named these out. Okay, so we're now gonna build out this chart down here at the bottom, this unit chart that shows 
when songs are making it onto the global level Shazam chart. And so this is the one where it has that interactivity where you click on it and you can get the Spotify playback and it changes the title over here. So before I build that out, I'm going to create a parameter because this is where this is where I built out those two calculated fields I mentioned at the beginning. <clears throat> so fastest way to create a parameter from a dimension is if you right click on it, go down to create parameter you automatically get this populated parameter. It, it Tableau names it for you. It brings in all of the data from that. And it's just a really fast way to get a parameter created super quickly. So we'll hit okay. And let me grab my calculated field. So again, I'm gonna use that Tableau hotkey that I love so much, Alt AC. And I'm going to do the trick that every Iron Visor has done since Lindsay Poulter did it in uh, 2019 which is you can create multiple calculated fields in the same window. And the way you do that is you put two backslashes and then you add whatever you want the name of your calculated field to be. And then if you highlight it and drag it over here, you're gonna see it pops up and it just automatically creates that calculated field for you. So I use this a lot just in regular non iron this life. When I have calculated fields that are very similar that I just need to copy and modify maybe one or two things. So it's a good thing. Uh, it's a good way to do that. And so this calculation is actually going to be what dictates our sort uh, in that final visualization. I'm going to explain it once I build the chart out because I think it'll be easier to see what's going on. But essentially, we're forcing a weighted rank with this calculation and I'll explain that in a minute. So let's go ahead and bring our month out onto columns. I'm gonna right click and drag again so I get that pop up. And then we're gonna bring artist name and track name out onto detail. And then I'm gonna bring that sort calculation that I just made and put it on rows. I'm going to edit this calculated field and this table count. And I'm gonna use specific dimensions and the way I like to think about calculated fields uh, when I'm using dimensions is I think for every month, so I want to uncheck month, I want, the cal I want the calculation to use artist and track name. So for every month, that's what you uncheck, and then whatever you want the field to use are the ones that you, you select. And so we're starting to get our shape come out here. I'm going to bring artist name onto color, and again, last time we're going to assign this color palette. And I want these to be circles, not lines. So you can see it's starting to come together. And I'm gonna right click and drag rank onto size so I can put average rank onto size. So now these are sized based off of where they are on the, on the chart. And again, we're using rank data, so we have to reverse this. So we'll go in here and go down to by range and reverse it. And I'm gonna bring it up just a little bit. So now we've got the bigger the dot, the higher the, the song is on the charts. And I'll bring the size down just down to this tick mark. Okay, now as promised, I'm gonna explain what this calculated field is doing. <laughs> so let's take it in stages. So here we've got this if calculation, right? It's an if then. So what I'm doing is just assigning kind of an arbitrary number to each artist. So I'm I want the artist to appear with Olivia Rodrigo at the top. The Kid Leroy in the middle and Gibby on at the bottom. And that was just to kind of mimic the order that they were from left to right on the visualization. So, in order to do that, I assigned a number of 1000 to, to the Kid Leroy. I assigned a value of a million to Olivia Rodrigo, so that would make sure that her values were at the top. And then Gibby on everyone else gets zero. And so you can see if I were to change this, if I were to give Olivia a value of 100, she's gonna change order here, right? If I were to give Giveon a value of a million, he's gonna jump to the top. And so that's really all this is doing is adding these numbers to these artists. And then I'm adding those kind of arbitrary numbers to the rank for each song. So none of the ranks or none of the songs had the exact same rank. So I added rank to these numbers, which gave me a unique number for each song. And then, I ranked all of that. So when I, by doing that, I forced a ranking system for all of the songs that were categorized by the artist. Now this negative one multiplier is just there completely because I messed up the first time. <laughs> if it's not there, 
uh, we're going to get things out of order. And instead of changing the numbers around, I just said, well, I'm going to multiply it by negative 1. And that's what ended up putting things back in the right order. So it was just a little time saver that I did when I was building things out. So I didn't want to show my headers on this because for this visual, my axis is just a uh, the first letter of each month and a two digit year. You can see that along here on the bottom, which isn't an option if you go in here and format this. So you can't even get this through a custom uh, format, right? If I try to do M and YY, I'm going to get numbers and I wanted letters. And so there isn't really a good way to do that. And so that's why I ended up just building out. Uh, I just put the axis on my background image just to start so that it was there for me. I'm going to hide all of these and I'm going to turn off my axis rulers again. And then because all of my actions are driven off of this chart, I named this with an underscore. That ensured that it went to the very top of my uh, of my, my list of sheets when I got to my actions. So it was really easy for me to find. And you'll see that when we add the actions. Okay, the very last thing I need to build out is just this song title that's going to change when folks click on the dots. And so we're going to use that other calculated field that I made, which is basically just returns a true false. So it says if the track name here is equal to the parameter track name, then it's going to return false. If not, it'll return true. And so we're going to filter to just keep those tracks that match the parameter that's selected. We're going to bring out artisan track name on text. And then I just formatted this. So this was bold. And now we're ready to start building out the dashboard. I'm actually going to jump to a version that where everything is already placed, just because it takes a long time to place all of these in the same in the right spots. Um, I am just going to show you though again why I did not uh, use a background color on these charts. And it's because when I put these in place, I was going to have to go in, right click format. Which again, I just didn't want to do. I didn't want to, oops, I didn't want to have to do those extra steps. So I left it transparent. So we're going to switch to this version where everything is placed already, uh, but none of my actions are set up. So I'm going to show you how I did all of those actions. So before I go into the actions, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring out a web page object, let's drag it out, and Tableau is going to say, well, what, what URL do you want to use? And I'm just going to leave it blank for right now. And I'm going to go ahead and place it in the right spot, right in that little glowing box down here. <laughs> Excuse me. And now I'm going to go ahead and add all of my actions. So what I wanted was when you click on a dot for that song to be highlighted throughout this chart, I wanted it to change the song label over here. And I wanted you to get that Spotify playback button. So we need three actions for that. So we'll go up and add an action. First one we'll add is that highlight action. And so this is what I'm saying before, why I named that sheet with an underscore. It just puts it right at the top so I know exactly where it is all the time. And then I'm going to go and select all of my other ones and use that spacebar trick to unselect them. I'm going to unselect them all here as well. So I've got my source sheet and my target sheet selected as just that global chart. And the only field I want this highlight to affect is the track name. So that when you select it, the track is highlighted. I'm going to add a parameter action to change the title of, um, of the song. So again, same trick, select them all, use my space bar. And I want the parameter to be affected, uh, this track name and the source again is track name. So we're going to hit OK. And now comes the Spotify playback. So uh, I want to show you this is the tutorial that I used in order to uh, figure out how to do this. So it's by Kieran Adair at the Data School. And so he's got a nice blog post and a video uh, that goes much more in depth than what I'm gonna go into that'll show you how to do it if you ever uh, need to do this in the future. But before you set up your actions, what you have to do is navigate to your song in Spotify. And then all the songs have this little ellipsis over here. So if you click on this and navigate down to share and embed track, then you come up here again to this little share icon. And this last one is copy embed code. So you're going to copy that. 
I'm going to paste it into just a blank Word document. And you get a whole lot of code that you don't actually need. The only thing you need is this right here. So this is the link that you're going to add to your URL action. And this part of the code or the link is the same for every single Spotify uh, song. What's different is this, you know, letter and number code at the end. So every song has a unique code here. So I copied all of those codes and I just put them into an Excel file with the track name. So all of those little unique link parts, I just have here in their own column attached to each song. And then I joined this Excel file up to my Spotify data. And so now I'm gonna copy the beginning of this link right here. So that's the part that's the same for everything. And so now when we add our URL action, well, again, we want that global chart and we want it to run when you select. And what we want is it for to populate that, that empty web object. So when you click on one of the songs, we want it to feed that web object and Tableau needs to know what we wanna feed it. So we're gonna paste the first half of that link that is the same for everything. And then we're gonna pipe in the link part, which is already in our data set, right? It's that you got column for all the songs. And we're gonna click okay and okay. And now when we click on a song, you can see it, the, the song is highlighted throughout the chart. The title changes because of that parameter action and we get that Spotify playback. So whenever you click on a song, it's gonna change all of those things for you. It's gonna highlight the data. And that is pretty much everything. So we've got our, uh, our pages animation, we've got our actions, and all of that we can do in 20 minutes uh, with a lot of duplication and a lot of hotkeys uh, and a lot of practice. So uh, that is everything. I think we're gonna open up to Q&A at this point. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Hey Lisa, thank you. Thank you for sharing your address. This was awesome. I think lot, lots of tips and tricks for all of us to just go ahead and see the presentation one more time. So thank you for sharing <laughs> that. So if you have questions for Lisa, just go ahead and put it into the chat or Q&A. Happy to go ahead and ask her. So one thing, there was a question from John and he was asking, how did you get interested in this topic? Like once the data set was given to you, what was your mindset and how did you prepare for that? Uh, so Tableau gives you the data, so you don't get to choose your topic just exclusively, right? We were given the chart metric data that focused on the music industry. And then I kind of backed into my story and my topic here. I had a totally different story kind of worked out up until about a week, week and a half before the competition. And I ended up changing direction. Um, and it was really just thinking, okay, I wanted to find a story that was going to be interesting to people. And so I kind of was thinking, well, what, what is interesting to me? And it's usually when somebody new comes along, that's really exciting, especially because it's so difficult to make it in the music industry. So when somebody does, it's like, oh, hey, there's this new person. And all of a sudden, especially like with Olivia Rodrigo, she like came out of nowhere and all of a sudden she was everywhere. So I thought, well, that's kind of an exciting exciting thing to show and then allowing users to or people to see kind of how the breakout happened using the data I thought was was kind of a cool a cool piece to it. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So Pauline is no 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 thank you for that. So Pauline okay. is asking how did you learn Tableau so fast? You just started using Tableau at the beginning of last year. I think I, I will just correct Pauline over here. So Lisa is already using Tableau for the last four years. She's, she joined the Tableau community last year. Yeah, Lisa, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, so that's right. So I started using Tableau when I started at my current job at Miracosta College. And so that was a little over four years ago now. Um, and I had really exclusively used Tableau for work and you know business type dashboards. And I got to the point where I kind of felt like we had been using, you know, the same metrics, the same types of visualizations doing, you know, we have templates at work. And so I felt like if I wanted to keep learning and growing and doing things that were more creative, I would need to kind of start investing in the community and doing the community projects and putting things on Tableau public. And that's what I started doing 
just last year. And so I kind of, you know, started weekends and evenings kind of visiting for fun in my, in my free time. And that's really when I started to, I think, learn a lot more, right? Because again, when you're at work, you're using it for very specific things. You have end users who have specific requirements and just getting out there and using different data sets allows you to kind of flex that creative muscle a little bit more. So I did not learn. To Lisa, it was it was a, sorry. definitely a lengthy process. And and just to ask you on the same question, what has been the role of community, right? Just to help you in in taking the craft of Tableau to the next level. Like, did you participate in any of the community initiatives? Did you just went ahead and reached out to some of the Tableau Zen masters or the champions? What what was your approach when you were when you joined the Tableau community? Yeah, so I mean, I had always kind of been aware that there was this community out there because whenever you Google something that you don't know how to do, you get all these blog posts and you get things in the forums and you think, oh, there's there are people out there who are incredibly helpful and supportive. And I don't know why it took me so long to find them and, and to actually engage in the community. I think because I'm not super into social media. And so the idea of getting a social media, you know, getting a Twitter account or getting a LinkedIn was kind of like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but then when I started, you know, I did a couple of makeover Mondays and I didn't, I posted them on public, but I didn't do anything. I didn't put them on Twitter or ask for feedback or anything. And then I did a real world fake data. Um, and you know, I created it, I put it on public and then I was like, well, the only way I can actually submit this to the actual project was through Twitter. I had to post it on Twitter and, you know, tag Mark Bradborn, who, um, who runs the project. And I did so very begrudging. I was like, okay, fine, I'm going to do it. And then as soon as I did, I realized what a mistake it had been to wait, because like I said, there are so many resources out there. There are so many people out there who want to support you and help you. And, um, and there's just so much inspiration out there. So I think, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really want to join, but then as soon as I did, I realized, oh, this was silly that I waited so long because there's so much help and support out there. So if you're, if you haven't gone putting your work out there, I would suggest doing it because like I said, everybody just wants the best, you know, if, as soon as you start asking for feedback, you're going to start getting better. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my journey into the community. Thank you, Lisa. So Tosin is asking, what learning resources accelerated your advancement from freelance, freelancer, casual user to Tableau guru and enthusiast? Uh, so tons. So, I mean, when I very, you know, I first started out learning Tableau, I just did those, you know, the training tutorials that Tableau puts out. And so it was just a lot of watching those videos and just getting the basics down. And then Really, it was kind of a learn as I go. You know, anytime I had a question, I would Google it, and the forums were incredibly helpful. I feel like if you ever are struggling with something and you can't find the answer, if you post something on the forums, people will respond in minutes. I mean, that's how uh, supportive and helpful this community is. So definitely put your questions out there. There are definitely certain uh, Zen masters and people out there who have blogs who I look to. I would learn so much from the Flare Lash Twins blog posts. Um, I feel like they're kind of my go-to. I really like the way they write their tutorials. They're very straightforward and they write it in a way that, I don't know, I just, I understand it really well. I've learned a ton from Andy Kreeble. If you go to his YouTube channel and just do his watch, watch me viz videos, you pick up so many little tips and techniques that you didn't even know you didn't know, right? Because when you're watching someone else do something, um, I think you just, you get to see how someone else does it and see their method of doing it. And again, learn things that you just didn't even know were possible or things that were out there. So those two are big. Um, I think I have, you know, the big book of dashboards is great. I like Steve Wexler's new book called the big picture. Um, those were probably some of my biggest Tableau things. Um, yeah. And then I, if you just Google a question, you'll find tons of blog posts out there that are incredibly helpful. Thank you, Lisa. I'm just seeing if I have not missed any of the questions. So maybe the last question from me, Lisa, what would be your advice for someone who's participating in INVIS next year? 
how they can go ahead and prepare for it and then how they should just go ahead and participate in IMS? Uh, I would say get feedback. So I had, I was petrified to ask people for feedback on my visits. You know, I would put things on Twitter and say, welcome. But I think you get so much more valuable feedback when you actually ask someone specifically. So if you send them a message, which is super daunting, I totally get that. I was, like I said, I was terrified to do that. Um, I don't know if Sarah Bartlett's going to do this again this year, but what she did last year was she set up a way for you to sign up to get feedback from people, um, you know, established people in the community, Zen masters and ambassadors, things like that. And I signed up for two of those feedback sessions. I was super scared like when I got that first feedback. I'm like, okay, a Zen master is going to look at my work. This is incredibly scary. But I did the first one and it was with Jackie Moore and she had great feedback and I made the viz a little bit better. And then I still felt like I could make it, like it still needed some tweaks. So I did another feedback session with Chantilly Juggernaut and Klaus Schut, Schut, Schlut. And again, each one of them had a different piece of feedback to give and it just kept making things better. And so I would say definitely asking for feedback is gonna be huge because everyone has, you know, when they look at things with fresh eyes, they're gonna see things that you haven't seen because you've been working on something for so long. Um, and they might have a new or fun way to do something. So definitely asking people for input. I know it's scary, but um, like I've said before, this community just wants what's best for you and they're incredibly supportive. So no one's gonna be judging you um, or your skill level or your visualization. They, they just want you to, to do well. Thank you, Lisa. I think with that, thanks a lot, Lisa. It was an honor to have you on this connect. Thank you for all your inspiration. Thank you for telling us all your tips and tricks. I hope I hope it will be valuable for everyone who is participating next gen in INS. I hope so too. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. Perfect. With that, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining this session. Take care, be safe, and we'll see.